Aloha, everyone, and welcome on behalf of Dimensions and Travel. We are delighted that you are joining us on our journey to the Hawaiian Islands again today with the Hawaii Convention and Visitors Bureau. This is number 30 in our travel agency series of virtual events, and we're so glad you're here. <clears throat> My name is Diana St. James, and I'm one of the owners of Dimensions of Travel, along with Jill Romano. We have been in business since 1978, 43 years, and our 28 travel advisors miss traveling so much right now, and we know you do too. And we feel like these virtual events are a great way for us to all go somewhere while we wait to travel safely again. They do, we hope, help keep the spirit of travel alive in our team, and we hope they do for you too. Before we get started, I want to cover uh, several housekeeping points. We are recording this event, and there will be a link that goes out afterwards, so uh, you can share it. We've got you all in listen only and no video mode. So we would appreciate it if you would keep it this way in order to minimize distractions for everyone. And finally, you are welcome to ask questions and you can do that by checking, clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. Well, during today's virtual trip to Hawaii, we're gonna be taking a deep dive with the Hawaii Convention Visitors Bureau into the rich culture of the Hawaiian Islands. If you're a first time visitor, we're hoping you can experience the traditions, the music, the dance, and the very warm hospitality that bring the Hawaiian people together and visitors together too. If you've been to Hawaii before, you can rediscover and just soak up the compassionate spirit of aloha. We all need this right now. But before we start your cultural journey to Hawaii, I wanted to introduce my business partner and agency co-owner, Jill Romano. Hey, Jill. Aloha, Diana and Robin, and aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so delighted to be back in Hawaii. I would uh, like to introduce you all today to Robin Basso. She is the Senior Director of Travel Industry Partnerships with the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau. As the Senior Director, Robin leads the development and execution of Hawaii's uh, Visitors and Convention Bureau sales and marketing strategy. Her responsibilities include managing the organization's travel trade training, leading content development of sales and marketing assets, and representing the HVCB at uh, travel industry events. She joined the uh, Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau in 2008 and has over 28 years experience in the travel industry and over 20 years concentrated on selling Hawaii. She is a certified travel counselor and resides in Chicago. And today we are so fortunate to have her live from Maui. So Robin, thank you. <laughs> oh, mahalo. Thank you. I couldn't be um, more blessed to be in one of the most beautiful, amazing places. And, uh, you know, I, I have um, been to Hawaii many, many times. I lived in Hawaii uh, for three years and um, it was a long hiatus. I was, I was not here for about a little over a year um, with things going on. So um, I've been here now for almost for a little over three weeks and I came to be in my happy place for a very special big birthday. Um, I turned 50 um, last, let's see, January 30th. And so I really wanted to be in a place that, you know, is so incredibly special to me um, and wanted to do something very special. And as we talk a little bit about the culture today, you'll kind of learn a little bit about um, how significant, um, you know, the dawning of a new day is in the Hawaiian culture. And so I was um, super uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to go up to the summit of Haleakala Crater on Maui, which is one of the largest dormant volcanoes in the world, for the sunrise. So, you know, you get up very, very early, but you go up to the top, it's very chilly. It was probably about 30 degrees, but it's absolutely magical. You know, you look out and the pre-dawn colors are just spectacular. And the clouds almost look like waves, you know, at, at the summit. And then you see that sun rise straight out of the center. And it is just 
absolutely mesmerizing. And you know, the, the Haleakala actually translates to mean house of the sun in Hawaiian. So I knew that on my big day, I wanted to be there to welcome, uh, you know, 50 in, in such an incredibly special way. So I, I was very, very blessed to do that, to have some wonderful vacation time. And I'm still very fortunate to be working now um, from Hawaii as well. And as Jill mentioned, I'm, I'm from Chicago and I live there. And if you've seen the weather, it's not good back home. <laughs> so I am super happy to be um, working with all of you guys um, here today talking about my favorite place in the entire world. So we'll kind of get moving forward here too. And, and I know a lot of you probably have been to Hawaii or have some background or experience experience in resorts and beaches and that kind of thing. So what we really wanted to do is to, you know, kind of peel back the really, um, you know, the various layers of the incredible history and culture um, that some people may not know as much about. And so I want to do that. And then um, I also want to make sure to um, provide, you know, great examples of how you can experience that culture here in Hawaii today. Um, so I kind of wanted to start off, um, you know, just by talking a little bit about the uniqueness of Hawaii, um, and especially now with, with, you know, travel protocols and restrictions, you know, the wonderful thing, of course, about Hawaii is you have, you know, the convenience, ease, and comfort of a U.S. destination, right? No passports, you don't have to worry about testing before you come back home, uh, but you have this incredibly rich Pacific Island culture um, where you have the, the hula and you have the beautiful music and these wonderful traditions. Um, so I kind of wanted to, you know, just uh, start off on that note. Um, which really makes Hawaii such an incredibly unique destination. So I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of history um, and, and some culture and again, you know, ways that um, that that translates into experiences today. So if you weren't aware, you know, Hawaii is, um, you know, it, it, it's a place of, of myths and legends and a lot of storytelling, you know, if you ever heard, heard the term, you know, talk story. Um, so when you talk about the creation of the Hawaiian Islands, so the legend actually says that Pele, the goddess of fire, and her sister Namaka, uh, the goddess of the sea, they were kind of mortal enemies, and that it was their passionate fight that actually resulted in this creation of the Hawaiian Islands. So there's a whole myth behind the creation. Um, and the science actually says that all the Hawaiian Islands were created millions of years ago through um, basically tectonic plate movement and volcanic activity. What that really means is that there is a hot spot beneath the surface of the ocean and that hot spot stays in the same spot. The tectonic plate is where the Hawaiian Islands are. So that plate actually moves about an inch and a half northwest per year. So basically this hot spot has, has really been um, what has created all of the Hawaiian Islands. So when you look at the Hawaiian Island chain, you actually have, you know, well, 132 islands in the entire chain. But from the northernmost island of Kauai, uh, Kauai is about 5 million years old. And then to the southernmost island in the chain, which is the island of Hawaii, which is under a million years old. And why that's important is that really speaks to uh, how the islands look, what is the topography. So Kauai as the oldest, over 5 million years old, is the most lush and tropical because it had all, has all of, this, um, all of these years to develop this beautiful rich vegetation where the island of Hawaii, right, with still the active volcano, is still developing new land. And I'm sure many of you heard we had incredible um, live uh, active lava flows in 2018, which added 900 acres of new land to the island of Hawaii. So it's still growing because that's the baby of the group. So it's still developing. So that's, I just kind of wanted to share that so that it gives you perspective on kind of the islands and how they look as you go north from the oldest of the islands to the southernmost island, to the youngest of all of the islands. So what's really interesting when you talk about who are the earliest arrivals in Hawaii and really kind of the first people to settle there um, were the, um, you know, were the Tahitians. So you had people arriving from 200 and 600 AD, the Tahitians coming over between 
1200 and 300 AD. And what's really interesting about that is that the only way that they could get to Hawaii were these huge outrigger canoes, right? 60 to 80 feet that could fit a family of 30. And the only way that they could actually journey over is by outrigger canoe. And the only way that they could navigate is by watching the swells of the waves and by the stars. So I can't get anywhere this day without, you know, uh, without GPS. But back then, that's the Polynesians had to navigate by using the stars. And so when they came to Hawaii, they brought a lot of their traditions, you know, their um, their gods, their chants, their religious practices, and many oral traditions. So they're very influential in early days of uh, people coming to Hawaii. Um, and what you can actually do is you can see a lot of this and experience a lot of this even still today because they've had such an incredible influence on the history of Hawaii. And they talk here a little bit about um, remains of Heiau. And Heiau basically is an ancient temple. So there are actually these ancient structures that you can visit which are places of worship. And it's, um, it's almost like, you know, if you're going to Europe and you're going into a church, you always want to approach these places, you know, with a sense of reverence and a sense of respect, because they are places that people came to worship. And so, you know, even now today, you can visit these incredible heiau. Um, so one of them is the Pu'uhonua Ohanau now. So don't worry, there won't be a test on that one. But it's called, it's nicknamed the City of Refuge. It's on the south shore of the island of Hawaii. And here you can visit and really kind of get an understanding of what ancient Hawaii was like and what it's like and what, the, what traditions the Tahitians brought over. Bringing it back a little bit more to modern times, um, the Bishop Museum. And the Bishop Museum is on the island of Oahu and it is the largest collection of Pacific and Polynesian art in the world. It is absolutely spectacular and one of my always must see, must do because it gives you so much of a look back into those historical times. It is absolutely amazing, um, you know, what they offer there. They even have um, an exhibit that really talks about astronomy and stargazing and all of that as well. And then, of course, the Polynesian Cultural Center, you know, it's been around for over 50 years. A couple of years back, they did a complete renovation. Um, they just reopened in January, um, completely reimagined. And what, what that's like is during the day, you can go and experience the different villages that represent all the different cultures that make up Hawaii. So you can visit Hawaii, Tahiti, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, New Zealand, and the Marquesas and really get this hands-on experience from a cultural perspective. They have a wonderful evening show and a luau, um, but it's a great way to really kind of experience the, the breadth of different cultures, the South Pacific cultures that really play into the history of Hawaii. So in talking a little bit about that, so stargazing um, is so wonderful in Hawaii, as you can imagine, the clear skies um, are just spectacular for stargazing. But as I mentioned, that is, the, the whole um, navigation process with the Polynesians is really so tied into the stars. And so there are these wonderful opportunities when you come to Hawaii to stargaze. So the bottom, uh, actually both photos are of the island of Hawaii, nicknamed the Big Island, of Mauna Kea. And Mauna Kea is actually the tallest island mountain on earth if you measure it from the bottom of the um, ocean to the summit okay it's over 33,000 feet in elevation it's taller than Mount Everest but if you're looking at from sea level it is about 14,000 feet so you can actually do these guided excursions that are absolutely incredible that take you up to the top to stargaze so as you go up to the top they show you different lava flows um, you're with astronomers so when you get up there you know and that sun goes down you can see 90% of all stars visible from Earth from that very spot. And you're with the astronomers, so they're pointing out the stars and the constellations. And I could literally see the rings of Saturn with a handheld telescope. Absolutely amazing. Um, so they have these wonderful excursions. And if, if you know you came over and you're still interested in stargazing, um, there's land-based stargazing opportunities as well. Um, you can do them in small groups, as couples, as a family. But again, it really ties into the culture and the Polynesians navigating to Hawaii. 
So, and another interesting thing um, about Hawaii is the concept of an apu a'a. And an apu a'a is a traditional land division. And I like to simply explain it as this is the Hawaiians were way ahead of the curve in terms of sustainability. So it's basically a, a, a land division from Mauka, which means the mountain, to the ocean, Makai. And basically it was a community of individuals and everyone has their own specific responsibilities from fishing to providing salt to farming to hunting. So it was really creating this self-sustainable uh, community. Um, so it's really interesting that the Hawaiians were so kind of ahead of the game in terms of really being completely self-sustainable within their particular community. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it just very interesting and it really does speak to, as I'll, as I'll talk about, kind of our evolution in Hawaii and really try to focus on more sustainable and responsible tourism. So we go a little bit into the history, right? So Hawaiians basically lived in isolation until the arrival of the British explorer, um, Captain James Cook. So he actually landed on the island of Kauai in 1778. And he was actually on a voyage to find the mythical Northwest passage between Europe and Asia. So, and actually his, the person that financed uh, his journey was the Earl of Sandwich. So he actually dubbed the, the chain of islands as the Sandwich Islands. And when he arrived um, by, obviously by boat, it was uh, what we call the Makahiki, which was a time of peace. So when he arrived and they saw this majestic boat and they saw this, you know, really gigantic um, man with an incredible stature, they thought he was a god, right? So they really che uh, treated him like a li'i or a chief. So then after he landed on Kauai, he decided to venture north. And when he actually came back, the time of peace had passed. So he ended up getting in a skirmish, a skirmish and was actually killed. And this was um, on the island of Hawaii, on the big island. Um, and he is credited with bringing, you know, things like, um, you know, muskets and cannons and basically, you know, war type tools because the Hawaiians didn't have anything like that prior to Captain Cook's arrival. So when you go to the island of Hawaii, um, it's hard to see in this picture, but it's on the, the bottom left-hand side, this white memorial is actually the um, spot of the death of Captain James Cook. And so you can actually go and visit this area. You have to do a tour and you can't actually go on to the monument, but there are some wonderful tours um, and kayak tours where you can go to the monument, see the place of his death, but also this is located at Kealakekua Bay on the southwest side of the island of Hawaii, which is absolutely positively one of the most amazing snorkeling and diving spots I've ever been to. So you get a little bit of the beauty, right? The marine life, the experience, but also a little bit of the history as well. So, you know, as you know, um, or you may not know, um, Hawaii is the only state that was once a kingdom. Um, and so if we go back many, many years, uh, when we talk about rulers of the islands, uh, you know, for a while, each island had a paramount ruler or a, a king or someone of royalty. Um, and so we refer to royalty as ali'i. So each island had their own king. Well, what happened is in 1810, you might, you might have heard before of King Kamehameha the Great. So he actually went and conquered each individual island and unified all of the islands under one rule. So he really was the first one to establish this incredible Kamehameha dynasty. So he's you know, a very, um, you know, a very important figure in the Hawaiian history and culture. And so even to this day, every June 11th, I believe it or not, I actually get the day off to celebrate King Kamehameha Day. So there's tons of incredible celebrations. There's a parade. You'll see his um, statue in many places around the islands. And so on Kamehameha Day, if you see that top left-hand um, photo, you see the beautiful lei um, draped all around him. So there's a lot of pageantry um, and a lot of um, special events around King Kamehameha Day. So there's lots of ways that you can experience that on all of the islands. So they have the Nu'uwano Pali Lookout on Oahu, um, El Valley on Maui, because that was the, seat, the um, site of a very major battle. And on the island of Hawaii, the Pu'ukohola Heiau. So again, there's lots of ways that you can um, experience firsthand the importance and significance of King Kamehameha.
So I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of the history and culture, you know, so um, King Kamehameha actually, so we unified the islands in 1810 and he passed away in 1819. So about this time we had whalers coming over um, and they came over to really, uh, they landed on, in, on Maui in the town of Lahaina, which if you've heard of Lahaina, it's really this, this you know, wonderful little town with shops and dining um, and a lot of the, um, the uh, cruising experiences. Like if you wanna do a, a dinner sale, a snorkel sale, even a ferry ride happens in Lahaina, but it's got this whaling town history where it's coming over in um, Lahaina. Um, we've got the first Christian missionaries coming over um, as well, which, um, you know, uh, that had a huge influence in terms of the history and the culture. Um, and they actually, you know, um, brought over some of their beliefs too. So it was interesting because you basically had, um, you know, the uh, Hawaiians that were, um, you know, just doing their own thing, doing hula. The missionaries came over and saw that and didn't think it was appropriate. So the missionaries actually were people that outlawed the hula, which is absolutely crazy, right, when you, when you actually think about it. So at the same time, you know, previous to this, there was no land ownership in Hawaii. So even Hawaiian people of Hawaiian descent could not own their own land. And that's why they had that whole apu a'a situation as well. So then you had the Great Mahele was enacted, basically enabling private land ownership for the first time for, for Hawaiians as well as for foreigners. And what this led to is the growth of the plantation era. So, you know, you had these huge, you know, this huge land in these plantations and you had no workers. There weren't enough people in Hawaii. So this led to incredible immigration from all over the world. Um, the Chinese were the first to come over. Then you had Japanese, Filipinos, the Portuguese people um, really. And this is why, you know, even today that Hawaii is such a multicultural society. So people came and they stayed and they shared their music, their language, their customs. So you can still see that through festivals um, and a variety of different experiences. And you might have heard before of the traditional plate lunch. And this actually stemmed from the plantation era of Hawaii. So everyone would bring, you know, whatever their foods were from home. So it could be if it's Korean, it's kaldi ribs, um, or, you know, it could, it could be a variety of different foods. So it's usually a protein, um, or it could be kalua pork, or it could be huli huli chicken, or mahi mahi, um, you know, two scoops of rice, a scoop of macaroni salad, basically enough to feed a small village. Um, but these are very popular still in Hawaii, these, um, you know, to to this day, but it the essence and it originated from that plantation era. So again, there's like lots of ways that you can still kind of get a feel for that multicultural um, influence from that plantation era of Hawaii. So basically the Kalakaua dynasty, King David Kalakaua um, ruled from 1874 to about 1893. And the reason I wanna mention um, King David Kalakaua is he's a very significant in the Hawaiian history. So when the missionaries outlawed the hula, um, he was not okay with it. He was always someone that believed in music and dance and celebration. Um, he was quite a partier himself. So he was the one that actually reinstituted the hula after it was outlawed by the missionaries. So he is fondly referred to as the Merry Monarch. And um, because of that, there's a wonderful festival, which I'll talk about the Merry Monarch Festival shortly, that really pays, um, pays homage to King David Kolakawa. And so um, Queen Liliuokalani, um, his sister, was actually the last reigning monarch to sit on the Hawaiian throne. So she was actually um, overthrown in 1893, establishing the Republic of Hawaii. Um, and this is a very interesting story because there's a lot of kind of back and forth um, and a lot of battle between, you know, kind of giving power to the throne and then American interests kind of coming in. So it's a very interesting story. So she was actually imprisoned at Iolani Palace, which is another thing that King David Kalakaua is known for. He was the one that built 
the Ulani Palace to really show the majesty, the majesty um, of the um, Hawaiian royalty of the Ali'i. So um, Queen Liliuokalani was imprisoned at Iolani Palace. Um, so she actually was, um, you know, was a big proponent of, of giving power to the Hawaiian people. She was a beautiful songwriter. Um, so she wrote this um, beautiful kind of ode, um, if you've ever heard of the song, Aloha Oi. So she is a very beloved figure um, in Hawaiian history. In, in um, April uh, 30th of 1900, the territory of Hawaii was formed. And then not until 1959, Hawaii actually became the 50th state. And so when you talk about how you can experience this, um, you know, I wanna talk a couple of things. The Merry Monarch Festival I wanted to let you know um, is typically held um, right around Easter on the island of Hawaii. And it is an amazing um, experience in terms of the, um, the level of competition of hula halaus, of hula schools. It is a very coveted, coveted ticket. Um, and there's wonderful parades and arts and crafts festivals around this very special um, event that again is all in celebration of King David Kalakaua, the Merry Monarch, for bringing back the previously outlawed hula. Iolani Palace, as I mentioned, again, built by King David Kalakaua, the palace that uh, Queen Liliuokalani was imprisoned. They have amazing docent-led tours, which are so incredibly special. And that's the thing. Most people think of Hawaii as just, you know, sun and beach and these kind of things. But there's really some amazing, even doing like a half-day cultural tour or on a rainier day, which is a little bit cloudy here today in Maui. Um, it's great to be able to experience this. You, you go through all the, the um, these special rooms. It is absolutely special spectacular and again gives you true insight into what it was like for the Ali'i and around the time of King David Kolokoa and um, Queen Liliuokalani. And again, when we talk about moving forward, right, and statehood, um, you know, one of the most amazing ways to experience uh, Hawaii's rich history, of course, is to visit the USS Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor. And um, it is an incredible experience. Here you do see the White Memorial, which is built over the sunken hull of the USS Arizona Memorial, which was built, which was, um, uh, the bombing was on December 7th. 1941 and really was the first start of the U.S.'s involvement in, in the war. And um, it is absolutely amazing. There's a whole museum and visitor center that's been expanded over the past, say, five to 10 years that you can really, um, you know, you can go and see the letters that the soldiers wrote home, letterman's jackets, and then all of this information about what led up to the war, what happened during and even afterwards. And right before you actually go out onto the memorial, you see an incredible documentary film. We actually, there's actually footage from the Japanese. It is so moving. I've probably seen it 20 times. And every time I get goosebumps or in Hawaii, as we say, chicken skin. So it is absolutely so incredible. When you're, you're taken out by Navy boat onto the memorial, it's so moving. You look down, you see the outline of the ship below, um, still 1177 crew members entombed in that ship. Um, this is their final resting place. Um, so, you know, sometimes people will take their fresh flower lay and throw it into the water as someone would put flowers at a grave. Still oil bubbling up about a quart and a half per day. Um, they've got a beautiful marble wall with all of the names of the soldiers that lost their lives that day. So it is truly one of those not to be missed experiences. Um, so incredibly special. And there's, I think, less than five um, or maybe even less than three now um, of the soldiers that were um, involved in that. And every December 7th, they have a, a beautiful commemoration celebration and, and you'll have a lot of the, the veterans, you know, come out. So it's really, really special special um, experience and again a way to really um, you know delve into that unique history of Hawaii. And we talk about the rise of tourism, you know, for, for much of the 20th century, it was really about sugar and pineapple. They were really the dominant 
um, you know, sources of revenue. Um, and then you had international tourism kind of taking hold, which really then took off um, as it still is the major economic driver um, of the state. So you had the first hotel in, uh, in all of Hawaii was the Moana Hotel in 1901, which is now known as the Moana Surf Rider. We call her the first lady of Waikiki. If you can imagine Waikiki with just one hotel. So really, really amazing. And then in 1927, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, um, you've probably seen the pink one, uh, they call it the Pink Palace um, of the Pacific. Um, and then, you know, as tourism grew, you know, so did the use of the, of the English language. And what's really unique that today, um, you know, the heritage of the islands still remains strong with actually Hawaiian and English as recognized official languages. So again, kind of interesting and lends itself to uh, the unique culture and experience of Hawaii as well. And when you talk about tourism, right, and you talk about something that's synonymous, is that spirit of aloha, right? It's that intangible. And I know many times you've heard it as a greeting. Aloha can mean love, can mean welcome, can be used as a greeting, but it really is so much more than that. It really is a, um, a value system that's woven into the fabric of the Hawaiian people. And, you know, people can refer to aloha as feelings of affection. It can be referred to with compassion, mercy, sympathy, kindness, grace and charity and are all these different translations of aloha so it's just it's it's a much larger concept right than somebody saying aloha at the start of a luau so it really is something that um that is so important uh to the hawaiian people and then, you know, we talk about expressions of aloha, right? And the traditions of, of lay greetings. And I am wearing a fresh a flower lei um, that I got today, which is just smells absolutely spectacular. So there's nothing more special, right? Than when you, when you get off that plane and you're welcomed with a beautiful fresh flower lei greeting. So that's traditionally, right? People are greeted with a fresh flower lei many times upon departure um, of Hawaii, but also it is a way to celebrate someone. So if someone has a birthday or an anniversary or Valentine's Day here in Hawaii or a graduation, um, it's very traditional to give a lei. And, and typically the lei are made with beautiful local flowers. Um, I absolutely love the tuberose. Oh my God, it smells like heaven or the pekaki. Sometimes you'll see plumeria, um, but there's a, a variety of different lei. Um, and again, they're just something very special, very traditional um, that, you know, hopefully you guys can all experience when you come to Hawaii. So we talk about another incredible um, experience and something that's synonymous with Hawaii is the hula. And hula, of course, as you know, is the traditional dance of Hawaii. Um, you know, and you've got the chants and the songs of hula that really preserve Hawaii's history and culture. It's all about storytelling, right? And storytelling with the hands. Um, and, you know, this describes Hawaiian legends, achievements, you know, and the beauty of nature. Um, so, and there's a couple different kinds of hula, you know, hula kahiko and hula awana. And hula kahiko is often referred to as ancient or more traditional hula. And hula awana is really referred to as like a modern hula. And the distinction, there's actually a little bit more of an important distinction between the differences. So beyond that, Hula kahiko, kahiko is traditionally um, performed as part of like a, a ceremony, an extension of ceremony, and is typically performed to an oli or a chant, and that is accompanied by percussion inst instruments. Sometimes you'll see like a gourd, that's called an ipu. So that's traditionally used as the percussion to kind of give the beat for the dancers to be able to follow. Now hula awana, so you see hula kahiko, an example of that is on the left, Hula awana is on the right, and that's a less formal um, hula that's performed kind of without the ceremony around it. So around the turn of the 20th century, hula began to evolve from kahiko more to awana, more to an informal awana. And typically with a hula awana, uh, the dancers more interact with the audience um, and the story is told with the accompaniment maybe of an instrument, of a guitar, um, you know, of a, of a bass or even of a ukulele.
Okay, so just, and what you can do is a lot of the times, many of the luau's kind of take you through history. So kind of from the ancient hula and takes you through, and some of them, you know, show you even more of the Tahitian dance and the Samoan fire knife dance, but then all, and then even um, the Maoris from New Zealand and how they influence. And then they bring you to hula awana, which is that more modern hula, which again is usually accompanied by song as well as by another musical instrument. And we talk about Hawaii's rich musical heritage. Um, it really has that has um, such a diverse um, mix. And again, the, the music comes from all of that immigration during the plantation era and everybody sharing their traditional music. And one thing I love about Hawaii, you know, again, it's storytelling. So that's, you know, that's what it's all about is even telling story through song. And anytime you're at a, a gathering in Hawaii, if it's just informal, you're going to like a pauhana, a dinner, something like that, it is not uncommon for someone to just get up pull out the ukulele and start singing and somebody get up and start dancing hula. It's just kind of way how, how people share stories and interact and celebrate. So, and what I love um, the music of Hawaii, um, many areas, you know, and things have changed a little bit, but, you know, walking down Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki and all the hotels just have live music, you know, from some more of the traditional to more of the modern. So you can really just kind of go hotel to hotel and experience, you know, the incredible music and of course the hula as well. So another way to really experience the culture, there's so many amazing festivals. And obviously last year we had to take a pause um, for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, but there are these wonderful Native Hawaiian festivals throughout the islands that you celebrate hula and music and art. Um, and if it's something that you're really interested in, you know, the, the travel advisors at, uh, at, at uh, you know, Jill and Diana and the whole team can help craft something even around some of these amazing festivals. Typically they're mostly in in, um, spring or the fall, um, but it's really special if you're able to do that and it really helps you connect to the culture as well as to the local people. So we've got ongoing calendars that we update um, that'll let you know what's happening um, throughout the islands. You know, and we talk about another aspect of tourism. I know that you guys probably, um, you know, know that um, Hawaii is synonymous with surf, but you might not know why. So in 1912, they had Olympic swimming champion and also a surfing icon, Duke Kahanamoku. So he brought surfing to the world stage. So he really kind of piqued everyone's interest in, in surf and canoeing with the Waikiki Beach Boys. Um, so, you know, to this day, you know, he is really the, the biggest influence in um, Hawaii's you know, uh, association with surf. And, you know, they call it the sport of kings and they call Oahu the birthplace of surfing. So here you see some pictures of Waikiki, which is the famous Waikiki Beach Boys kind of became famous. So outworker canoes are really, really popular. Um, and actually I had an amazing experience here in Maui. Um, I had, um, you know, I was able to paddle an outworker canoe. So again, the significance of the dawn being very important to Hawaii, I was able to actually actually um, engage in this small, only four people. They had a kapuna or an elder blow the conch shell to signify the start of a new day, right? Um, which is so special to the Hawaiian people. And then they did a chance to kind of welcome in the new day. We got in the outrigger canoe and we paddled out at dawn. So absolutely incredible. And that's the kind of legacy that Duke Kahanamoku left. Um, and of course, Surf lessons are just absolutely fantastic and, and so popular, especially in Waikiki. The surf competitions are typically in November or December, where they've got the triple crown of surfing. And you can see waves up to 40 or 50 feet. It is absolutely um, incredible. Um, so definitely something to experience, to see here. And if you weren't aware, uh, surfing is actually going to be added to the Olympics. So that'll be really exciting to see again, you know, surfing kind of take that world stage. You know, and when you talk about kind of, um, you know, as I said, tourism kind of really began 1901 with the Moana, then 1927, the Pink Palace. By the 1960s, it actually started to reach what we call the neighbor islands. So from Oahu to Maui to Hawaii to the island of Hawaii. And so there was tons and tons of development. And then, you know, as of the last, you know, couple of years, there really was a lot of slowdown in development, not a lot of new build, but maybe some renovations and really shifting the focus to preserving Hawaii's pristine environment, 
and culture. And it's really all about a shift in thinking and saying, you know, we're going to talk about kuleana or responsibility that we have to take care of this beautiful place. So it is the special place it is for generations to come. And so we actually, um, a couple of years ago, had developed a program called, called Tourism Kuleana. And again, for us, as we are the marketing organization for the state of Hawaii, it is our, you know, role to make sure that when people come to Hawaii, um, that they, they, when they arrive, that they leave Hawaii better than when they arrived. Um, and there's a variety of different elements to this. It's about preserving natural resources. So focusing on communicating the importance of using reef safe sunscreen, or when you're hiking to stay on the trails to not you know, negatively impact the local flora or fauna. And also about perpetuating the Hawaiian culture, which we're talking about today. So you'll see that at the hotels, they all have amazing like cultural advisors and cultural experiences. So you can learn to make a fresh flower lei. You can watch someone pound Poi. Um, you can learn about the art of hula. So you'll see these cultural experiences at hotels, of course, activities, because it is something that is so important that we keep alive for generations to come. And then we actually just um, launched a new, um, it's not a campaign, it, it's really a, an overarching initiative from Malama Hawaii. And Malama in Hawaii means to take care. Simply put, to take care of ourselves, each other, and the land, the aina, which, you know, it's all right, everything we've all been through, it is all about, right, caring for ourselves, caring for each other. And um, it's really um, a, a program that is meant to uh, encourage regenerative tourism, where visitors can come to Hawaii. And what they do is they can participate in a volunteerism activity. And if they do that, you can get a free night stay. So it's, you know, it's um, doing something special, it's doing something meaningful, it's giving back to the destination. And again, ensuring that Hawaii is the beautiful place that it is for years and years to come. And there's a variety of different um, activities. We've got, um, you know, uh, the Hawaii Tour Authority, which is our governing body and partners in Hawaii kind of came together to create this program and to create these purposeful activities. And they can range anything from a beach cleanup to helping to make quilts for the kapuna or the elders. So there's a variety of different types of experiences, but how amazing to be able to come to Hawaii and actually give back to Hawaii and connect with local people and have this amazing enriching experience. So we've got um, you know, a variety of different partners that we, um, that we work with, but you know, we really wanted to, to talk about this in terms of you know, staying open to new experiences, staying connected to the culture, to the people. You know, it's, it's meant to stay mindful, right? About, about um, you know, what's happening in destination and, and to really be present and be in the moment, of course, to stay safe um, now more than ever, you know, to keep each other safe, to keep visitors safe, as well as our local people. And again, stay involved in um, what's happening in Hawaii and all of our efforts to preserve it for the future. And we have, you know, different hotel partners that participate. Um, there's getting more and more added every year. So, you know, when you're headed out to Hawaii, you could talk with one of the Dimension and Travel uh, advisors and they can let you know, hey, this hotel participates in this program. You can not only get a free night, but of course you'll have that amazing experience. So they can share some additional details, but I just kind of wanted to share that because it is such a special experience. And of course, when we talk about Hawaii's culture, it is, all, very much tied to the food, right? We already talked about the plate lunch, um, but it's really about that focus on self-sustainability, right? Not bringing in everything from the mainland, um, you know, that is very expensive to import. Let's use what we have here in Hawaii and have people experience it. So it's really about plant-based sourcing, um, you know, and all these wonderful different ethnic and cultural influences, as I mentioned, got some incredible passionate chefs that love and believe in what they're doing. And it's all about, like I said, aloha, Aina. So aloha means love of the land, respect of the land, right? So if there's a lot of emphasis on local farms and a lot of the celebrity chefs, you know, have their own farms and do tours. So you're really experiencing in that farm to table experience. And there's so many ways to experience this in Hawaii. That top left shot is actually at O'o Farms in Maui, which is fantastic. You do a tour with a local chef, you know, um, you help to pick some of the produce, then they have the chef come and prepare a lovely gourmet organic lunch. You can pair it with some uh, beautiful local wine from Maui's winery. 
what an incredible experience. The bottom shot is Elite Kula Lavender. They have these beautiful lavender farms. They make amazing um, body and culinary products. So you can do tours. You can just enjoy some lavender tea and scones. And of course, everybody knows Kona Coffee. So you can come to the island of Hawaii and even uh, you can um, get involved in a tour and even come home with your own pound of 100% reserve beans. And those are just the tip of the iceberg. There's hamakua mushrooms, there's big island bees, there's the Hawaiian vanilla plantation where they, um, they make all these wonderful vanilla products because they have an orchid farm right on site. So a lot of ways that that Aloha Aina sustainability um, that you can experience that firsthand as well. And, you know, Hawaii is also known for their Hawaiian regional cuisine. And, and that actually began in the 90s with a group of chefs. And you may know, like Roy Yamaguchi, Alan Wong, who were really the pioneers of, you know, using local ingredients and putting their unique flair and their staple on it. So Hawaiian regional cuisine still lives these days and just continues to evolve and get better and better um, as a culinary experience. So I've definitely done my share of eating while in Hawaii as well. I mean, there's amazing food festivals. And again, that, those were paused last year, but from upscale, like the Kapalu Food and Wine Festival, there's the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival, which used to be on one island. Now it's on four islands. And even if you're adventuresome in May, they've got the Spam Jam. So, you know, in Hawaii, they love their Spam. So you can actually try a variety of spam uh, menu items if you're brave um, and so just tons of different festivals and again we've got calendars and and the ladies at dimensions and travel can tell you what's going on and even crafting a vacation experience around the food festivals let me tell you is not a bad thing at all so keep that in mind as well so I know I shared a lot of stuff and I know we're getting to um, you know the the latter part of the session uh, but really kind of you know, just want to tell you how special Hawaii is, and I hope that I was able to share something that was new or intriguing to you that that was um, you know something you didn't know before and and thought like, wow, you know, I, I really didn't realize um, what a cultural experience beyond the beauty and the adventure and the beaches and the golf and the spa, you know, what a special cultural experience Hawaii is. So with that, um, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up for Q and A. Robin, thank you so much. My gosh, uh, I am planning my own trip to the Big Island. And I think the two things that you talked about that really caught my eye is the vanilla plantation and the idea of greeting the sunrise. I've always been very focused on the sunset while I was there. So just opening my eyes to the sunrise and given the time difference, it's much easier to get up for a sunrise than <laughs> Yes, your are back at home is already uh, is on East okay. Coast time. So I always tell people, if you want to see the sunrise or do Haleakala or any of that, do it your first full day. <laughs> your body clock is going to be up that early anyway. Exactly. Well, Jill, do we have any questions? Um, we don't have any questions at this okay. time. I've got a couple of people that I responded to directly that will follow okay. up with them. And okay. You know, a huge thank you to Robin again today. That was a jam-packed set of information. And I've been to the islands many, many times. And I just want to assure everyone, we've all learned something today. It, yes. was, uh, it was wonderful from the, the historical perspective to the hula, to the music, to the food. Um, it just makes me want to get on a plane again and go right back. So... You enjoy your time over there. A big happy birthday to you again and enjoy the rest of your time. And we'll look forward to some updates from you when you get back. And to everyone that joined us today, thank you so much. Please reach out to your Dimensions and Travel Travel Advisor. They would be happy to help you plan your trip to Hawaii. Absolutely. Aloha, everyone. And thank you for joining us. We'd love to help you go to Hawaii if that uh, works for you. And um, uh, thank you again, Robin. Bye-bye. Oh, my pleasure. Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha.